find that at hardintentions.com. Uh, I want to thank everybody for logging in. And uh, I guess I'll just pick up where I left off last week. Um, yeah, I talked a little bit about after I got out of Preston. Uh, you know, really, you know, Preston kind of fucked me up. That was a, That's where things kind of all went bad, you know. I mean, I did get into tattooing kind of a lot when I was there. That's one good thing because my tattooing ended up uh, getting me into the uh, art. So I went from tattooing to art, basically. It was a long journey, but that's one good thing that I did get out of Preston. But, uh... You know, when I got out, I had a really shitty attitude, man. I mean, uh, I've been exposed to some, some things like, uh, you know, violence and, and uh, you know, gang mentality. Things I never really, you know, I got a little bit of it in youth authority my first time around. But the second time, I mean, there were guys leaving Preston and, and uh, ended up in uh, prison. And uh, they were writing letters from San Quentin and Tracy over to Preston. So it was kind of a prep school for prison, you know. Uh, like I said, I seen the first guy I ever seen get stabbed inside jail, a jail setting there in Preston. It's kind of brutal. <clears throat> so when I got out, I, w I had a really fucked up attitude. And uh, that pulled my mom's pad again. I lasted about, you know, a week or two. And then I cut out and I lived with my friend Jimbo and his mom. And, uh, you know, she was a biker chick, she was a speed freak. You know, she used to, you know, bone down all the connections for sack of dope. And then of course, uh, I kind of normalized a lot of behavior, illegal shit, you know, like uh, buying guns from people for, for dope, for crank, and then reselling them for more crank and stuff like that, or for cash, you know. <clears throat> My friend Jimbo, you know, whenever we got a big lump of crank, he'd get it some, I'd get some, his mom would get some. And it seemed like, uh, you know, I'd make a little money and party, but, uh, you know, he would just piss his away. He'd run off with some chick for a few days and come back empty-handed. You know, that was his thing. But, uh, you know, I, I was more leaning towards, you know, I wanted a motorcycle and, uh, you know, my friends, like I say, that were into building motorcycles and all that kind of stuff, you know, they were kind of worried about me, you know. Uh, I'd go up the hill to Crest where we hang out, and they'd, they'd say, hey, Mitch, you know, uh, you're going to end up in jail. You're going to end up in prison. And I'd say, man, I don't give a fuck. You know, because, I, I mean, I, I remember, like, one time uh, this friend of ours, Tank, brought this guy over the house, and... Uh, you know, he, he was uh, supposed to do something for Carol and, you know, my friend's mom. Ended up telling her, hey, I'm going to take this money. I'm burning you. Fuck you. And Tank beat him up and took his, took the money back. And I waited outside for the dude to leave. And when he left, uh, I beat him up a little bit and poked a few holes in him with my K-bar. You know, I mean, that's the mentality I started developing. Like, you know, hey, fuck, fuck it, you know. Uh... If violence settles a the score, then violence settles a the score. Something you learn in jail, you know? Uh, youth authority, jail, whatever you want to call it. So, uh, you know, I had a few cases like that where, you know, I, I, I fucked some guys up pretty good over money, owing money. Uh, and like I said, you know, I got that motorcycle. Uh, guy owed some money. I never really told the story to my friends. They knew I got the motorcycle from somebody else. But, uh, so I took it, I took his motorcycle. And uh, I, never, I rode it for a year, never registered it. I ended up giving it to a friend of mine. And he gave me a vehicle, a car, and some cash, you know, <clears throat> right before I went to prison. But, uh, you know, I just figured, you know, might is right, you know. I never really uh, got the picture, you know, in my head that no matter how tough you are, right, there's somebody tougher than you until I ended up in prison, but that's a story to tell down the road. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's that's what life was all about, man. When I was out, uh, it was all about, you know, crank, guns, you know, making money from crank, making money from guns, 
riding a motorcycle, hanging out with my friends. I mean, getting a job was kind of the last thing on my mind up until right before I got busted. <coughs> so, uh, that's basically what I did for about a year. I hung out with, you know, my girlfriend. I had a couple different girlfriends when I was out. And, uh, you know, just uh, raising hell. And then towards the end, I was living with this friend of mine, uh, Kenny Horse. He introduced me to a couple guys. Well, he introduced me to one guy who ended up being my co-defendant in this uh, case that sent me to prison. And then I met a friend of his that he grew up with. And uh, so my crime partner was a boxer. And uh, of course, this is down towards the end of the year, you know, that I was out. Um, he was a boxer. But, I, you know, I didn't really make the connection there that he lost his a boxing license or whatever because he was busy bar fighting. <laughs> he kept getting in trouble bar fighting. So, you know, he couldn't box in the ring anymore. But anyways, we used to go into Tracy's Karate Studio right next to the bar. And, uh, you know, we'd go in the back room and we'd spar and he'd teach me a little bit about boxing. And uh, so that was my introduction to, to my, uh, my co-defendant. You know, and of course we'd drink and run around you know, uh, run around and uh, make deals, make money, sell guns, make money, sell dope, make money. You know, just cruise around with him. I met him, and uh, I knew him for about not even two months, probably about a month and a half before my case happened. And, uh, yeah, so I was staying, where I live was about two blocks down the street from this bar that I used to go into all the time. He said, well, you know, you were 17, so I had to get in the bar, right? But, uh, you know, I was a big kid and I had some hair on my face and it was a biker bar, Dumont's. And so uh, I could get in the bar and uh, we're in there one night. And I remember we had uh, seen this other guy, Dan, he put, uh, my co-defendant gave him his knife, you know, and he, and he put some finger grooves in the handle, so he, you know, grind it down the wood and polished it up, looked real nice. And I remember he gave it to him that night in the bar. Uh, went in, had a few beers, and there he was with Dan, got his knife back, and uh, I remember there's a sign in that bar that said, uh, check your knives in with a bartender. They wanted to hold your knife while you're in the bar. And uh, he told her, hey, you want my knife? And she says, no, I trust you. <laughs> yeah, bad move. And, uh, you know, this guy came in, sat down next to us, started running his mouth about somebody that had just had a funeral. Uh, basically said, you know, that the guy was a punk and he got what he had coming to him. And, uh, you know, that... That was the wrong thing to say to us. Um, so he started arguing with one of my co-defendants and uh, he hit him in the face with a beer pitcher, my co-defendant. And uh, I jumped up off the stool and hit the guy a few times. And my other co-defendant said, hey, let him fight. So that guy had gotten up off the ground and they kind of just grabbed each other and staggered out onto the sidewalk. And uh, when I went out there, uh, this dude was on top of my co-defendant, sitting on his chest, beating him in the face. So I started kicking him, you know. And uh, hey, look, you know, my mentality was, you know, you fuck with my friends, and I'm gonna fuck with you. And you know, at the time, these guys were my friends, so I started stomping this guy, kicking his ribs in, and putting a boot to his head. And uh, out of nowhere. Somebody pulled out a knife and stabbed the guy. And uh, that was all she wrote. You know, we took off out the bar. And uh, yeah, we all got busted that night. Uh, one of my co-defendants went to uh, a house full of dauphines and uh, evidently told them what happened. Called the bar a couple times. Of course, they traced the phone call and they had the phone tapped recorded his phone call <coughs> so <coughs> they went over and busted him and uh those dope fiends told him where we were living 
and uh, we all got caught that night. And uh, so I was a juvenile, and, and uh, I got turned over to adult court, went over to county jail, and uh, fought my, my case with them. All three of us went to trial. The thing is, when we got arrested, the first deal they offered us was uh, uh, myself and the guy who was getting beaten up. They offered us both a manslaughter, which would have been six years. And then the other guy, they offered him a second degree murder, which would have been 15 to life. But the deal wasn't just to take a deal and hit the door. It was uh, all three guys had to take a deal or no deal. Uh, if one guy wanted to take a deal and the others didn't, then it was, uh, you had to get on the witness stand and see what your part in the crime was. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, uh, yeah, my lawyer says, look, once you get on a witness stand, they can ask you whatever they want. You know, basically, uh, you know, they wanted, you know, later on they offered me a deal. Of course, we didn't take the deal because no one wanted to, uh, the other guy didn't want to take the 15 to life deal. Later on, uh, they came at me with a deal like assault with a deadly weapon, three years if you testify. And then they told me, hey, you know, you signed a paper, agree to testify, you can go home tonight. And I told my lawyer, look, man, no fucking deals, right? And uh, he said, look, they're going to make a rat out of you or they're going to send you to prison. And uh, I said, well, I'm guessing I'm going to prison. And, we, you know, we took a trial. We sat in a county jail about a year fighting it. From start to finish, you know, till I got on the bus and hit the hit the reception center, and uh, yeah, it was a joke. My two co-defendants went to state prison straight away, and then I went to Youth Authority for a 90-day observation to see if they wanted to accept me. And uh, as soon as I got there, they basically told me, "Hey, you know, we're not taking you back. You know, you've been here twice. You didn't learn anything, so you know, you're not coming here." If I would have went to Youth Authority, I would have got out in three years. Um, yeah. When I was there, though, I had to, came up on a little weed, a little crank, and some quaaludes. And uh, I remember they hit my house. It thought they smelled some weed or something. And uh, I seen them coming, you know. I, I heard them coming, so I, I had a little crank left. I snorted that, and... and uh, I put the little joint I had left in my mouth and walked out. They searched my cell, they didn't find it. And uh, man, I remember I was up on that shit for, cause you know, I was just kind of pacing myself off. But uh, yeah, that was, that was a bad scene, you know? And uh, yeah, I got in a little altercation with a couple guys, you know, not, not too good when you're trying to avoid state prison, but you know, when you're 18 years old, you know, by then I turned 18. I was kind of a knucklehead. I didn't want to hear it. I knew I was going to prison, so. Anyways, I went back to the county jail and got sentenced to state prison. So I went to prison a couple months after my co-defendants. And, uh, you know, I got there. I was in a unit was where they put youngsters, you know, uh, and uh, single cell. And they sent me down to this room. They're like, hey, you're gonna be in here for three days taking tests. Uh, you know, it's an evaluation to see where you're at with education, psychological testing, all this other shit. And they got some inmate in there who's uh, uh, on the permanent work crew. <clears throat> well, you know, some people would refer to as trustees or whatever, there's no such thing though. He was a permanent work crew there at Chino. And he's like, yeah, you're going to be in here for three days taking tests. So I go, hey, I walked up and turned my paperwork in. I said, man, I'm not sitting in here for three days. You know, I just got out of county jail. I've been locked up in that county jail for a year. I want to go play handball. So uh, this sergeant came and got me, man. He's like, hey, asshole, you know, you want to be a fucking tough guy? <laughs> I said, nah, man, I just don't want to sit in there for three days taking tests. You know, I want to go to the yard and get some fresh air. So, uh. He put me in a unit uh, that was just coming off lockdown for a stabbing. They had some white-black conflict where some white dude stabbed some black dudes, some gang members, you know, prison gang members stabbed some black guys. So they were just coming off lockdown, and uh, there was a lot of tension. Yeah, I got yard a few times, and then uh, it was all bad. 
there was a lot of disrespect on the tier. I remember this guy Curly from Long Beach, he, he was going to Soledad and uh, the next morning and he told me, hey youngster, send me your line. So I shot him a, a line down to his cell and I pull it in, there's a pillowcase with uh, two big uh, bed spring knives in there, you know, pokers. I thought, oh shit, you know. And he yells down the deer, hey, you know what those are for, right? And I tell him, yeah, I know what those are for. And uh, so I gave one of them to another guy. And, uh, you know, a couple days later, I ended up stabbing some guy, you know, over uh, disrespect on the deer. Uh, I got a shoot term for that. And uh, that shoot term lasted, uh, it was an 18 to two, two year shoot term, 18 months to two years. And I ended up doing like four and a half years in a shoe over that. Because, uh, you know, the sh once you get in the hole, this shoe is a hole, you know, it's a segregation, whatever you want to call it. But uh, it's punishment, you know. And uh, man, I, you know, it was madness. I mean, I seen my first murder within a few months. Uh, you know, guys getting stabbed up pretty regular. And uh, it was just like, man, nobody give a fuck. And, and uh, what got me was, you know, some guy would be uh, that guy, you know, have a little bit of juice for the fellas or whatever. And, uh, you know, he would smut somebody he didn't like. And for people to ask me, you know, what's smut? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, smut is when I don't like you and I've got a little bit of influence so I say, hey, you know, Joey's a rat. Or, you know, Joey raped his girlfriend or Joey beat up his wife or, you know, uh, Joey sodomized that guy in that robbery, man. Uh, he, you know, he's anything that's not true. Things that guys don't like, uh, you know, that could be either a beat down or a stabbing offense, that's smut. So what I saw was, you know, guys with smut guys, and the smut's not true, obviously, and uh, and uh, they instigate people to stab that guy and sometimes kill him. And I seen that, you know, and uh, I thought, man, this is bullshit, you know, because um, you know, in youth authority, it's like, hey, you get ingrained in your head that hey, you know, we're white, and white dudes stick together and all this bullshit. But when you get to prison, it's not like that. It's just. Uh, it's just a way to control people, you know, really, you know, you know, I'm down for, you know, my homeboys, my friends and all that shit. And, uh, you know, regardless of whether or not you have black dudes or Mexicans on the yard or Asians that you're friendly with, which I did, uh, I've known several black dudes that I was real friendly with, you still side with your own people. You can't go against your own people and that's just the way it is. It's not, uh, it doesn't make you a racist or nothing. It just means that's just the way prison is. But, uh, you know, the, the reason it's like that is, is uh, so certain groups of people can control their people. Each race can does it to, to their own. You know, that's how they control shit. And like I said before, in some ways, it's a positive thing because if you've got guys running amok, running up debts with other races, for drugs or disrespecting other races, you know, it gets it gets all the white dudes in a wreck. So you got to have some kind of structure and some kind of uh, you know rules, mandatory shit. Otherwise, everything's just a big fucking mess, and people get hurt, stabbed, killed, whatever, over someone else's stupidity. So, on some regards, a lot of this stuff is valid and it's uh, it's necessary. But on some other uh, aspects of it. it you know it's just a way to control people um, you know regulate who buys what from who and you know guys get killed for not kicking down and it's an ugly scene but uh, yeah I remember the first the first murder I seen in there was was just in a matter of months and uh, <clears throat> guys playing cards and a couple dudes walked up to him stabbed him in the neck and the back and you know, cut his heart in half and cut his jugular vein out. And uh, I remember the guy walking right in my direction, you know. And uh, I was playing cards and I go, hey man, this guy's gonna die. 
and the guys I was playing cards with, they didn't see it. They were facing like me, you know, and, and I, they go, deal the cards, motherfucker. I go, hey, this dude's gonna die, dude. We need to move. And uh, they turn around and saw that shit, and they're like, yeah. So, but, uh, you know, the guy hit the ground, and, you know, he was dead before he hit the ground. And I was still 18 years old when I saw that, man. I thought, man, this shit, you know. And that, and that's where, when I get back to saying, look, man, and this for, you know, all you young guys that think, you know, you're all that, and you're tough as, and, you know, hard as a rock and twice as solid and all that shit. Um, you might be tough, and I'm not doubting that. But there's always someone tougher. And when I got to prison, I realized if you want to be tough in prison, then you're going to have to have a nice big knife and you're going to have to use it. That's what tough guys do in prison. They stab and kill people without hesitation. And, uh, you know, that's when you realize, you, you know, you might be able to take care of yourself and, and all that shit, but, uh, you know, that, that that takes it to another level, you know. It's another level of toughness. That's really not toughness. That's just a hardness, man, that people have in their heart. You know, that's uh, that's not me, you know. Even back then, I, I was a fuck up and I'll fight and, you know, I'd do whatever. But uh, that kind of shit, man, I was, I, was, I was really not down with, you know. <coughs> and <coughs> I ended up in San Quentin in the hole. And... Uh, you know, I seen uh, quite a bit of shit up there. You know, they, they got signs all over that place that say no warning shots. And uh, they're not kidding, you know. Uh, they got guy on the gun rail. He's about 12, 15 feet out off the tier from your cell. And uh, before I left there, that dude, he had a Mini-14, a shotgun, and a pistol on his side. And then uh, if you were fighting, which we were lucky, because in Folsom, all they had was mini 14s, and uh, they didn't fuck around. But in San Quentin, they would shoot you with the shotgun. It had a seven and a half grain bird shot in it, and uh, if you were fighting, they'd shoot you with a shotgun, you know, and they'd shoot the piss out of you. I mean, I've seen guys get shot 15, 20, 25 times, you know, uh, and that shit hurts. I got some of that shit in my leg. They're supposed to shoot it. It's called skip shot, where they shoot the ground in front of you and it ricochets up into you. But uh, I remember uh, guys fighting, a couple guys fighting, you know, and they shot right down on them, and that stuff bounced up off the ground and into their face and blinded them. A couple of guys, so they quit using the uh, the bird shot, and and, uh, and then they went to nine millimeters. They had H and K nine millimeters that would glaze around, so they would shoot, you know, and. Uh, a glazer rounds like an exploding round. Um, you know, Folsom, they shot some guys an arm off, uh, you know, for no reason. So, I mean, it, you know, prison was dangerous, man. It was a dangerous place to be. Um, you know, <clears throat> I just decided at one point, man, that uh, all the stabbing and shit, and I was cool. I was cool with that shit. And I told my homeboys, look, you know, I've been in the hole for a while. I want to get the fuck out of the hole and uh, get out to the main line, you know, I got a life sentence, and I got a program, try to get the fuck out of prison. That's before they really shut the door and said, you know, if you got a life sentence, you're never getting out. So uh, they're like, yeah, all right. So uh, I remember one time after that, I was on the yard, you know, in the hall, sitting, and they bring out a little sack lunch, you know, a, a sandwich and a fruit and whatnot, and we're sitting there on this curb, by the handball court, and this guy had came from Tracy to San Quentin, and, and uh, my homeboy was on one side of me, and this dude was sitting on the other side of me, and you know I didn't really know him, and I'm just eating my lunch, and and uh, well, it turns out this guy was uh, they call a white farmer, white nester. It's a new white family. They were white dudes who were scared of the northern Mexicans and the blacks, so they would like uh, side. They would like get information about things that the white dudes were gonna do, and they would tell the the northerners and blacks, and then they would they would uh, of course get off first on the whites. So these guys were they were bad. They were targets, you know. So this guy, I remember asking this guy, you know, if he came from Tracy, and he's like, oh no no no. And uh, well, my homeboy, while I'm eating, he just gets up, 
on this side of me and just leans over me and starts stabbing this dude. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck, man? You know, I just calmly, you know, you don't, and when things like that happen, you know, you just, you gotta act normal. You know, you don't panic, you don't run. You just like take note and move, you know? So I just stood up and started walking away and, and I got about five steps away, man, and they started shooting him, you know? And uh, I remember that dude was walking off the yard and he had a, he had a piece sticking out of his shoulder by his, you know, in between his shoulder and his chest. It was gleaming in the sun, you know? Blood pouring out of it. And uh, later on, we'd come out in the next yard we had. I told my homeboy, I said, man, what the fuck, dude? You almost got me shot, you know? And he goes, uh, goes, well, you know, you said you didn't want to be a part of this shit. You know, you want to get out of the hole and, and uh, try to program out on the main line and shit. And I said, man, give me a five minutes notice next time so I can get the fuck out of the way, you know? But, uh, yeah, prison was brutal, man. I mean, uh, it was it was brutal. Uh, yeah. So after uh, a few years in the hole, about three and a half years now, the reason that my term in the hole was extended so long is, you know, when something went wrong, when something wasn't right, um, you know, we would flood, we would burn, we'd throw shit and piss on the cops, uh, whatever. Back then we could smoke, we'd make little, uh, you know, bombs out of matches, whatever, throw them out there. So, um, you know, I remember one time uh, my, they were fucking with my neighbor. He was a Mexican cat, but the cops were fucking with him. And I was talking shit to the cop, like, hey man, leave him the fuck alone, this and that. And the cop was a black dude, and he had a, he had a puffy afro, real greasy, you know, real shiny with grease. And the other cop there was a Mexican. and. Uh, and uh, so Jaime lit a little rag on fire and he was whipping it out the bars at the cop, you know, and I was, I was looking out with, with my mirror, you know, and I'm talking shit, you know, hey, leave him alone, you fucking punk, and all that stuff. And I noticed a piece of that floated up in the air, you know, it was on fire and it, and it came down and landed right on top of that cop's afro. And it started burning his hair. <laughs> and I just started laughing. And, and he, he actually looked at me and said, what's so fucking funny, you know? <laughs> then the other cop seen his hair on fire, you know, swatted it out. <laughs> Man, that dude was mad as a motherfucker. You know, there's nothing I could do because we're slammed. But they, they went in the cell and they fucked that dude up, man. They drug him downstairs to a strip cell, you know. But, uh, you know, shit like that. Uh, you know, like one time they told us, hey, man, uh, they were doing sheet exchange, so they have all the sheets on the tier. And they said, uh, you know, I go, hey, where's the fucking mail? The mail's late. And the cop says, oh, you know, they lost the mail for this unit. So uh, we tell them, look, man, you got till 8.30 to bring the fucking mail. And they just kind of laugh. So as he was... Uh, Passing out the sheets, you know, they do sheet exchange. You give them your dirty ones, they give you a couple clean ones. So the cop went downstairs, all the cops were down for a meeting or something. And we pulled all them sheets in and distributed them up and down the tier, man. So, you know, you got, you know, two or three tiers just burning sheets, man, just bonfires and just, uh, and then flooding. Once everything was burned, then you just flood and flood and flood. And, you know, in the end, I mean, it fucked with us, but it fucked with them too. They didn't like that shit, you know. But that's the kind of stuff that you do, man. And, and it's like, it's a group thing. Uh, I remember I was approved to transfer. And uh, I mean, I was within a week of transfer and uh, they pass out breakfast and I told the sergeant, I go, hey man, where's the fucking milk? This milk's rotten that all the little milk cartons are like a week past the expiration date. And I said, hey man, this milk's rotten, dude. Where's the milk? And he's like, well, you know, that's just the way it is. And I said, nah, it's bullshit, man. I got milk in the fucking kitchen. Go get us some milk. And everyone's yelling about the milk, you know? And and I'm down at the end of the tier, so they see me with their mirrors talk to this sergeant, and they're like, what the fuck's up? And uh, I said, man, it's on. You know, we're gonna fuck tear this place up, get us some milk. And uh, 
my sergeant told me, hey man, don't do it, Smiley, you're leaving. I said, I don't give a fuck. I'm not just gonna sit here and let you fuck us over, you know? And uh, he goes, give me a half an hour. <laughs> and so everyone's yelling, I said, he, he wants a half an hour. And he came back in about 15 minutes with milk. He goes, first he goes, hey, I'll bring you some milk. I said, man, fuck that, you bring milk for everybody, you know? Not just me. And uh, he did. 15 minutes went by, man. They brought milk into the unit for everybody. Cold and fresh, you know? So, I mean, that's that's just what you got to do, man, to, you know, I don't know how it is now, but that's uh, that's how it was. I remember one time, man, uh, you know, before I went to San Quentin, they had passed out, you know, Sunday back then we had Grand Slam. We had fried potatoes, fried eggs, and bacon breakfast, you know, every Sunday. And they brought the, they'd cook it and, and bring the trays up to the tier and they had guys on the tier, inmates. These dudes are gang members and they're serious dudes. And uh, uh, the guy tells the cop, hey man, these fucking eggs are cold. And he, and he looks at him, he goes, man, what do you, you know, what do you want me to do, man? Uh, he says, I want you to take these fucking eggs down there and recook them. I want hot food on this tier. And the guy goes, oh man, you know, he said his name, you know. And, uh, Come on, he goes, man. Uh, I want some fucking hot food up here, and and uh, they took all them trays down there, and, and they refried all them eggs, and, and them trays came back up to the tier with hot potatoes and eggs. I mean, you know, they knew he wasn't fucking around. Uh, there would be consequences for not having hot food on the tier, you know. And uh, I mean, nowadays that kind of shit's unheard of. You know, I mean. I don't see that kind of shit happening anymore. Back then, man, them dudes were, they, you know, they were vicious dudes, man, and, and and they didn't give a shit. I mean, they would just as soon stab a cop as another inmate, so, you know. So, anyways, after about four and a half years of that, they let me out of the hole. But one thing I want to say this too is, uh, when I was in the hole, they used to have a hobby program in the prison, even for guys in the hole. You could order art supplies through the hobby program, and uh, then they, they end up doing away with that in the hole uh, under a work incentive program, you know. But uh, I had stacks of paper, pens, pencils, you know, and that's what I did every night. I would uh, uh, draw all night, eat breakfast, shower, sleep, and then I draw all night, eat breakfast, go to the yard because I had yard every other day. And uh, that was my program. I draw all night, you know, every night. And uh, that was my thing, you know. Practice tattooing on my legs, and uh, you know they did. They had some cops that would let us, you know, put one guy in another guy's cell during yard time, and and I'd let them tattoo on each other until this one dude, <clears throat> this one dude Hawk had an idea. He was gonna go to court and escape. So uh, I didn't know about this until after it happened, but uh, you know, he talked to the cop. He says, hey, I want a tattoo on this kid. And uh, he says, all right. So he got the kid in the cell. He tattooed on him, and then right before lockup, you know, when they start bringing the yard in, he had to come and get that kid and put him back in his cell. And uh, when the cop was coming to get him, uh, Hawk just started stabbing the kid up, man, in the cell. I mean, it's no way to get away with it, you know? And uh, they were like, what the fuck? So his excuse was later on that he wanted to go out to court so he could escape, you know? That was his, which never happened. Some fantasy it is, you know? But uh, yeah, it was, it was just, uh, that was a sad deal. But uh, anyways, that, that was the beginning of my art, really. It was. Uh, when you spend 24-7 in a cage, you're either gonna find something to do or you're gonna go nuts. And that was my thing to do, you know? And uh, yeah, that's a little bit of my first few years in prison. And uh, before I close out, I just wanna thank everybody who's subscribed to our channel. If you like it, please hit the like button and please subscribe. Uh, means a lot to us your support for our YouTube channel for our Instagram channel which is Mitch Smiley 790 uh, we also have our heart intentions uh, website 
where we got t-shirts and stickers and all that good stuff print some of my artwork and uh, a little something I've been doing here lately is uh, a guy contacted me and asked me to do some artwork for him so uh, this is his dad riding his motorcycle something I've been working on last few days I got a lot of work to do on it that's his pops riding across the desert <laughs> yeah that's an acrylic painting on a board I got a couple days work into it uh, yeah maybe one of these days in the future I can do a little art demo or something uh, in the meantime thanks for tuning in and I uh, hope to have an interview coming up here with a guy I was in prison with who did about 40 years uh, take care of yourselves and enjoy your day. Thank you very much, folks.